Look, I'm gonna be honest with you right now. When I was a junior developer, I thought I was hot stuff. I was shipping code, I was closing tickets. You know, I felt like a rock star, but I wasn't. I wasn't even close. Today, I'm going to share six signs that show you that you're still kind of thinking like a junior developer. And I've been guilty of every single one of these. Before we dive in, let me be clear. These aren't insults. Every senior developer or hire that you admire has made these mistakes. The difference is they've stuck around long enough to learn from them. So as we go through these, if you find yourself thinking, oh no, that's me, that's good. That's literally how you grow. That recognition is the first step. And what's fun about this video is that I didn't create all six of these. The first three are stories about myself, and the last three are from a LinkedIn poll that I created, where I found my three favorite comments and asked them to send me an email with their story. So starting with sign number one, which is my story, which I'm calling The Deploy. This was my second year as a developer. I was working at a giant manufacturing company, which made about 2,400 orders a day. My job was to build a bulk discount feature, buy three or more items, get a 15% off discount. Sounds simple. I built this, and I'm guessing about four days. Tests were green. Code review was done by Wednesday, and maybe I deployed by Thursday afternoon. Right before the sprint ended, I hit deploy to make sure that it was out there and ready to be used. I probably did a little victory dance and probably announced to pretty much nobody in particular that I did it. <laughs> I went home feeling like a rock star. I remember talking to my girlfriend, who is now my wife, about it. Then the next day, I got a Slack message from my manager. That said, getting weird support tickets. Are you around? A handful of customers had received double discounts. We were losing thousands of dollars, and I had no idea why. I, I never tested for an individual adding two discounts to every order. I only did the happy path. I only tested to see if they had a single discount, not if they could like double them up. And that was a big mistake. But the real lesson here is a little bit bigger than that. Making code work is the bare minimum of the job. The real job is making code that survives real users in production. You never know what they're going to be doing. So you have to make sure that you create edge cases for everything you write. Sign two, I am calling the wrong layer. As most developers are, I thought debugging meant just adding, you know, console logs everywhere, adding print statements until the problem revealed itself. Well, I knew there were proper ways to debug, right? Like you could use a uh, you could use a debugger and all that, but who has the time for that when I can just throw print statements everywhere or trying to set up a debugger for some legacy application? So that's what I did. I just kind of threw print statements everywhere. I had logs in every function, you know, that says like test one, test two, test three with like the time date to try and find the flow of how the function is running. Um, I probably spent a few hours trying to figure out this bug and all my logs showed that the code was running perfectly. Data flowed through every function. I had all this evidence that my code was working properly, but it didn't work. And I had no idea because I was not just testing something pretty dumb. So I started second guessing myself and I felt genuinely stuck. So I asked Adel, who was my mentor at the time. He was a senior developer who joined us from a bigger consulting company that was willing to work with me. I explained to him that I couldn't find the bug. And he asked one question. He was like, what does the API response look like? And I showed him and it just said failure. And it said like system denied, whatever. But I never looked at the HTTP header because the HTTP header was returning a 200 because our system was old and it was legacy. But it was actually failing on authentication. And that's because on the local environment, we have our JWT. We have like a mock JWT in our .env file. But in production, we need a real session. And I wasn't checking to see if the debug function was even running right through the authentication flow. And it wasn't, it was working locally, but it wasn't working in production. And that was because I did not have correct logging set up. And there's a couple of different ways to implement debugging, right? Like you can do like debugger and go through step by step or have proper telemetry to look at logs and everything. But I didn't do any of that. I just started throwing print statements everywhere. You know, it's, it's not about volume and just trying to figure it out before actually understanding the problem. You have to go and look at the logs, learn how to use a debugger, and really go through everything step by step to be able to find the solution that you're looking for. And, and if I looked at the logs from the beginning, I would have noticed that something was wrong in production, not just jumped into my local host environment. But at least with that, I knew something was wrong. Sign number three that we're about to get into is way more risky because everything looks good until it's not. And sign three, I'm calling the scroll. 
So now I'm about two years in, I'm working for the same company and I'm building a content management platform system because we're trying to get into the SEO game a little bit more and we're trying to create like blogs and articles. So my job is to create a simple page, show all the articles and authors, and they have like tags attached to each article as well. I trusted my ORM completely. I was using Hibernate with Java. It made everything so easy. Uh, you know, just give me the articles and their um, authors and, you know, fetch the tags automatically. And it just handles all the SQL. I never looked at what the SQL was doing, like what it was generating. Why would I? The whole point of using an ORM is to abstract the database level away. Then my manager pinged me. <laughs> he said, message from the QA team. The, the, the article page is taking 45 seconds to load. Is this a bug or is it supposed to be this slow? Um, I don't think it should be that slow. <laughs> my manager was like, what, what happened? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Let me, let me go ahead and check it out. So we sat down together and we opened up the logs. This time we are using the logs. And we look at the database logs and he starts scrolling. He just keeps scrolling. Hundreds of database queries for a single page load. Oh gosh, what did I do? I created a for loop. And what was happening was for every query, I was doing one query for the articles. And we had 200 articles, then 200 queries for the authors, then 200 more queries for the tags. I was not using joins. I was relying on just the ORM and using a for loop to fetch all the data. I was essentially DDoSing my own database with a feature I wrote. The team has been suffering from this low page for like a few days and the QA team reached out to me finally. I was like, hey, this has taken a really long time um, to load because of my code. <laughs> So we ended up fixing this. All we did was use some joins. You can actually do joins in the ORM. I think we actually did a normal select join statement um, because we had that in some other areas of the code. But the biggest thing here wasn't necessarily about the ORM. It was just not trusting everything, right? Abstracting layers away from you is great, but you still have to understand the layer that it's that's being abstracted. Or you might run into this kind of N plus one issue, which really messes up performance. Now, sign number four was an expensive lesson. And let me tell you why it exists. Now, again, before I dive into this one, I actually ran a poll on my LinkedIn audience. Um, I asked, what's a mistake you made as a junior developer that you're embarrassed to admit? And I actually got some pretty good feedback. And it was kind of funny reading through them. Um, almost 100 responses. And I noticed some patterns between them. The next few signs come directly from those submissions because it turns out I'm not the only one who, you know, messes up all the time, especially in the beginning of my career. But I did not reveal the people's names. So this first one came from a backend developer. And of course, I'm keeping them anonymous. But they said I could share their story. And here's what they wrote. Let me grab my iPad so I can read it directly to you. All right. I was working at a subscription box company, thousands of monthly payments. My task was to improve our Stripe webhook handling. Payment succeeded to activate subscription simple enough, but payment fails. I didn't really think about that part. I thought about what the code should be doing when everything worked. Failure felt like an edge case, not a primary concern. Well, that's already a big issue. Failure always needs to be a primary concern. Then a customer credit card got declined. Normal thing happens all the time, but my, my code threw an unhandled exception. The webhook returned a 500 error to Stripe. Here's what I didn't know when a Stripe webhook fails. It retries over and over. Dozens of retries over 72 hours. Each retry triggered a Lambda that failed, but not before hitting our a database and inventory system. The AWS bill that week was noticeably higher than usual. One failed payment cascaded into real infrastructure costs. The worst part, we didn't have alerts. Oh, God. I, I didn't notice for days the webhook was failing on repeat. The customer never knew their payment failed. My code knew how to succeed. I had no idea how to fail. My senior dev said something to me that stuck with me. The happy path is the least important path. Every user will hit it and it's the most tested. It's all about the failure paths that matter because those are the ones that break your business. This, when I first read this, this was an incredible story because it's not necessarily like you're you're messing up the, the user experience. I mean, you are a little bit like they should be getting um, an error, but the user knows that they're kind of getting an error. Now, anytime you're dealing with credit cards and money, you know, that can definitely make issues happen. But what's interesting about this story is it ties back to an infrastructure cost. The webhook failed, which then hits their Lambda, which then hits the database infrastructure. Now, I don't know what the increase cost was, but that's like a real use case where infrastructure, there's real money attached to it. It's not just the user um, dissatisfaction. 
but it's also real costs attached to the infrastructure, the hardware that's running your system. And the last line is very good. Every user will hit the most important path. That's so true. And that should be tested, but the edge cases definitely need to be tested as well. Now, I did the same thing for sign number five, which we're calling the week that never shipped. This one came from a developer at a B2B SaaS company, and this is what he sent to me. I was working at a project management software company. Got a ticket that said add user analytics tracking. Okay, first off, if you want to add user analytics tracking, post hog is goat. I love using that company. I was excited to finally build something substantial, and I thought great developers just figure things out without asking questions. Asking felt like admitting I didn't know what I was doing. So I opened my IDE and started coding it immediately. Event schemas, collecting APIs, scheduling jobs, even a basic dashboard. My manager has been traveling this week. I wanted to impress him when he got back, so I just kept building. About a week of work, thousands of lines of code, clean, tested, documented. I was proud. Demo day, manager's first question, why didn't you just use Google Analytics? That would have taken an hour. The marketing team already used Google Analytics. They just wanted to track three events, sign up, upgrades, cancellations. They didn't need custom infrastructure. They just needed a few lines of JavaScript. A week of work, never shipped, probably still sitting in an old branch somewhere. My manager gave me three questions to ask before any task afterwards. Oh gosh, that's like essentially getting put on the pip list. What problem am I solving? Is there an existing solution? What's the simplest thing that works? I love this because it's exactly why I came up with the 30 minute rule. Before starting any tasks that takes more than a day, spend 30 minutes with a pen and paper, not coding, just thinking, what am I building? Why? What it exists? The story sucks. Like, sucks for that person. <laughs> not sucks in general. But sucks for that person, but I like it. There's not too much to say. He over-engineered by a lot. And the 30-minute rule, I sort of like it. I almost never use a pen and paper. But the idea of planning before implementation is, you know, is a must. So that's kind of a hilarious story. And, 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 and to kind of go with it, don't it over-engineer. Now, this was using Google Analytics. Like I said, I prefer PostHog. But, but they all kind of do the same thing at the end of the day. Just the biggest thing here is just to build what you need to build. We don't need to over-engineer. All right, now, sign number six is two days and two characters. Now, this next submission made me laugh because I've been on both sides before. Here's what they wrote. I was about eight months into my career. I was working at a logistics company, microservices, sort of just a bunch of stuff in Docker. That's so true. That's most people that say they run microservices. It's just multiple services, not microservices. I was setting up my local development environment. One container needed to talk to PostgreSQL. The error connection refused. Postgres was running. I could see it in Docker. Port was exposed. Everything looked right. I spent two days on this. Stack overflow, Docker documentation, GitHub issues. I changed ports, rebuilt containers, reinstalled Docker, started wondering if my laptop was broken. Why didn't I ask for help? Because asking for help felt like a failure. In my mind, senior developers just knew everything. End of day two, I finally mentioned it to a senior dev that I was having a small Docker issue. She looked at my Docker Compose YAML file for about 10 seconds and said, you're connecting to local host from inside a container. Local host inside a container refers to that container, not your host machine. Use DB instead. I changed local host to DB, worked immediately. A few characters, two days of frustration. After that, I overcorrected, stopped asking, started asking questions about everything. How do I do this? What should I use here? Until the same dev sat down with me. Have you tried Googling first? Struggling a little is how you learn. I traded one bad habit for another. I thought this was interesting because we've all been in a situation where a small fix, something small that you could ask a question will fix a bigger issue that's wasting a ton of time. Like, I think this person should have asked the senior dev earlier why their Docker environment was not working, especially instead of going to the lengths of like deleting containers, restarting them, deleting Docker, reinstarting it like that. That seems like a lot. But then at the same time, I'm kind of like, screw the senior engineer because you just help them. They now feel comfortable asking you for questions. And now you're following up with, have you tried Googling first? The uh, future problem like that seems wrong. Like we're all the same team here. Asking for help isn't admitting defeat. It's just optimizing for results over ego. And truly on my team, I'd rather have someone that asks a lot of questions than the other way around. Because like every mistake is a lesson. The gap between junior and senior isn't always intelligence. It's not even necessarily like years of experience. Sometimes it's just accumulation of painful lessons that changes how you think 
over time, right? Like the more experiences you have, the more things you've seen, the better you can react to certain errors that might show up and just overall make yourself a better dev. So I disagree with how the senior is treating them afterwards. If anything, I would say we need to just ask more questions in general. So I'm actually going to disagree with the senior engineer on the second part, but I like the the, the first part. If you enjoy this, go ahead and bop that like button because I enjoy making these videos and I love that you're choosing to watch this channel. So hope you enjoyed something and I'll see you in the next video.